there are great themes in the scripture and great days. You can travel with me for just a moment. Which day would you like to go back and visit? The day of creation? That would be an amazing day to watch the world be created. Maybe you'd like to go into the future, the day when Jesus comes. That will be an amazing day. Maybe the first millennium or two in the kingdom as we gather around the throne of grace. What an amazing time that will be. Today we will spend some time at the foot of the cross. It is probably the most intense and complex day in history. Filled with all goodness and all wickedness at the same time. It is the best day in earth's history and it is the worst day in earth's history. As we go there together, may our hearts be moved and drawn closer to Christ. Join me in prayer. Father, we've gathered here. We've gathered here with open hearts to come to the foot of the cross again today. As we seek to lift up Jesus, Father, speak to us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. May the words from your sacred scripture find lodging in our hearts. May our hearts be drawn closer to you that we might love you more. We see the amazing love poured out from heaven as Christ gave his life for us. Bless us with your presence today as we look to Jesus. We ask in his precious name. Amen. It's an amazing thing when you consider the crucifixion of Jesus. Where do you start and where do you stop? We're going to look this morning at the last words of Jesus. There are seven sayings in the scripture. And I believe that these seven sayings encompass a message and a story for us today. You'll find yourself somewhere lingering at the foot of the cross today, somewhere in the shadows, somewhere, somewhere identifying with one of the people there, somewhere the actions, the themes, will just kind of come forward and touch and move your heart today. As we look at the cross today in the last uh, the last sayings of Jesus. We find the first one in Luke chapter 23, and I'd invite you just jot the reference down. We'll not look each of these texts up, but you can jot the reference down and look them up this afternoon. The first one, Jesus, as he hung on the cross, cried out, as they had taken him from, uh, from Caiaphas to Pilate, Pilate, uh, as they brought him to Pilate because uh, the Jews did not have power uh, to, to authorize the crucifixion of anyone. It remained the authority of the Roman Empire. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Pilate gave him the choice. Choose this day, Barabbas, a known murderer, or Jesus. And they chose Barabbas over the sacred Son of God. Pilate said, what shall I do with them? And the mad crowd cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And he was taken from Pilate, the holy Son of God, to the cross 
for they nailed him to the cross. And that cross was suspended between heaven and earth. And as pain racked his body, as he looked out over those gathered around the foot of the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I find all kinds of hope in those words. How about you, friends? I find all kinds of confusion in those words as well. I find all kinds of trouble in those words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. It's easy when you look at the Roman soldiers and you say they were just doing their jobs. It's easy to understand how would he would be able to proclaim that and say they do not know what they would do. But off in the shadows and off in the distance were the religious rulers of the day. And scriptures had prophesied this day for many millennium. How can they be labeled they know not what they do? And down through the stream of time, today we live. And the words of Jesus are just as applicable as they were then. To the crowds today, they know not what they do. Forgiveness is extended, friends, to those who do not know what they do. And it even goes further than that. Forgiveness is not merited. Forgiveness is the intentional and voluntary process by which a victim undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding offense. Let's go of the negative emotions such as vengefulness with an increased ability to wish the offender well. Forgiveness is different from condoning or conditioning. Forgiveness is the willingness to go from getting, uh, getting vengeance and forgiving those who have offended you. I don't know about you, but forgiveness doesn't come to me naturally. When I am deeply hurt and deeply wounded, the text that comes to my mind is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it just weighs heavy in my heart and eats at my soul and becomes a cancer that destroys my spiritual relationship with my Lord Jesus. And I go to the cross and I see Him dying. And on that cross, He says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And I have to say for just a minute, if the Son of God can die for my sins, why, isn't I, why is it that I cannot die to self for those who sin against me? I love the cross, but it's a difficult place. Colossians says that in Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. In Christ we find our forgiveness. Ephesians says, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, listen, friends, the hope that we have in the cross, to the praise and glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us acceptable in the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. Unacceptable. Sinful men and women today become acceptable in Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. I love the cross. I hate the cross because it calls me a sinner, but it turns me to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom I glance upon, and His words 
Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. So I have to ask you, friends, do you know what you do? You may. And you may willingly do it. And the good news is, He died that you might have forgiveness. Not presumptively, continually doing it. But the goodness and grace is not earned. The goodness and grace is poured out because of His love for each one of us. The first message is a message of forgiveness on the cross. The second message today that we hear in the last words of Jesus, simply written in Luke 23, verse 43, as a, as a thieves that were crucified with Jesus, one cried out, Oh, forgive me, for I have sinned. And Jesus' response was, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Three crosses that day. Christ in the center. Two convicted criminals. The law said they shall be crucified. And even on the cross, as both of them, with all of the weight of sin and their life coming to an end, look to Jesus. One's heart became hardened. And the other could see in the face of Jesus softness in love. The other could see in the face of Jesus hope and forgiveness. And he cried out, save me this day. And Jesus simply said the wonderful words of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not after you've done something, but today you will be with me guaranteed in paradise. I love those words. Don't you? Because when we call upon Jesus, He's there to hear the heart cry of the human heart. He doesn't wait for something that you do. He doesn't wait for circumstances to be different. All it takes is turning and looking to Jesus. My favorite book, Desire of Ages, says, The one comfort that Christ found on the cross were the words of the thief longing for salvation. Did you catch that, friends? With all that was hanging on the shoulders of Jesus on the cross that day, no comfort to be found before Him. One comfort was a heart that was turned to Jesus. In the deepest, in the darkest, in the quietest hours, when you struggle spiritually and you turn and you look at Jesus on the cross and you quietly cry out, Jesus, help me! It brings Him comfort. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that I can't go anywhere, nobody will understand what's happened to me, my past, my current situation? I'm not worthy. And there just is no hope. And all darkness uh, surrounds the soul. It's at that time the light of the cross penetrates your darkness. And the promise is today, I will be with you. And be assured when I come again, you will be with me in paradise. Not because of your worthiness, but because of the worthiness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiveness. Salvation. The third message of the cross is one of loving relationship. As Jesus looked down from the cross, John 19, verses 26 and 27, says, Jesus looked down from the cross and beheld His mother. When Jesus saw His mother and the disciples standing be, uh, beside whom He loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. The story of salvation is a story of loving relationships. Jesus knew that his mother would need care. Jesus knew 
that the care of the beloved disciple, and he entrusted the care for his mother into the hands of the beloved disciple, commonly thought to be named John. He was caring and loving, and knew that though he would, though he would be taken from her, he was entrusting and caring for her in the future. You may, you may be dealing with uncertainties in your life, in family relationships. You may be dealing with complexities that nobody can understand except Jesus. Except God will help you through and work through those. But the story of the cross is not only one of human relationships, but it's a story of identification and a story of human, uh, the depths of human experience. For you find in Matthew 27, the fourth of the seven last sayings, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a saying that's hard to understand. For you see in the life of Jesus, He had led the perfect life. He had done everything that the Father had asked Him to do. He had restored sight to the blind men. He had cured the lepers. He brought goodness and light everywhere He went. He knew he was in the presence of his Father. His will was totally committed to his Father. Yet on the cross, on the cross, when all of the powers of darkness surrounded and shrouded that, that cross with darkness, the cry from Christ was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I will guarantee you, friends, if you haven't been there, the devil will come calling at some point in time and you will wonder where God is. And just where Jesus was on the cross, that's where you will find yourself. And it's through that darkest hour that the Heavenly Father comes through. For there was a moment on the cross that the fullness of hell prevailed. And Jesus could not see through the darkness of the tomb. The weight of sin was upon him, and he did not have the assurance from heaven that his sacrifice, was, his sacrifice would be complete and acceptable. For sin cannot come into the presence of a holy God. You have to understand the full magnitude of what was resting in the moment at that decision. And it's amazing to me when he cried out, My God, O oh Father, why have you forsaken me? Not sure the atonement would be complete. And a sense of abandonment was felt that day. That very dark Friday, the darkest day in earth's history. The best day in earth's history. The abandonment that comes to us at times. We can look to the cross and realize that the Father never forsake, forsook Him never left him. Through the darkness, he was right there. Not sensing it at the time, but claiming the assurance. The distress of the cross took its physical toll on Jesus. The distress of the cross, as Jesus cried out simply, I thirst. In John 29, uh, 19, verse 28, And after these things, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, He pled for something to drink. I thirst. They took a branch and put a sponge on it and gave Him a little something to moisten His lips. 
a sponge filled with vinegar, that he might have just a bit of comfort. The forsakenness, the salvation, the abandonment, the distress, the pain, the anguish, the agony. All he would have had to do is say, Father, cleanse the earth now, and the Father would have been there, and sin would have been obliterated. John chapter 19, verse 30, are the words of the triumph of the cross. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, He said the words, It is finished. He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. Three simple words, it is finished, mark the triumph of the eternal battle. Nothing more could be added to it. Nothing could be taken from it. Simply the proclamation that in Christ, by Christ's sacrifice, through His death, we find forgiveness today. Nothing added to it. Nothing taken from it. You know when you start a marathon. How many of you have ever run a marathon? How many of you have ever wanted to run a marathon? How many of you have ever walked one? I've walked one or two. Somewhere around mile eight or nine or ten, you hit the wall if you're really running the marathon. And you, you just push through it. And when you see that finish line approaching and you cross the finish line, the word that comes to you is, it is finished. There is no going back. It's done. It's complete. It's over. And Jesus simply cried out, it is finished. And triumph eternally sealed the devil's destiny on the cross that day. Evil with all of its ugliness and all of its blackness and all of its hatefulness and all of its disdain for, un, uh, for godly and holy things would be made manifest in ways never before possible. It is finished. The battle is over. Satan's fate was sealed that day. The last words of Jesus before he died was simply, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And with those words, he gave up the ghost and breathed his last. Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. The darkest Friday in earth's history is probably the one that tr troubles and humbles my soul the most. Because there's many places in Scripture I can go to find comfort. But somehow looking at the cross of Jesus, when I look at the difficulties that I face in my life, they pale when I come to the foot of the cross. When I look at the darkness of situations in others' lives, they pale with the eternal separation that Jesus felt on the cross. 
When I look at the hopelessness, it pales. When I look at the way that Jesus went to the cross to die for sin. But when I look at the cross of Jesus, I gain hope. I gain courage. I gain power to go on. Because Jesus simply proclaimed, It is finished. Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. As you go forth during this Easter season, when you find yourself not knowing what to do, when you go down this way and that way and nothing's working out, when you, when you reach difficulties that there's no human answer for. Simply turn to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me for the, for the sins I've committed. I'm in a space, I'm in a time where I don't sense Your presence very well. But Father, Father, You promised that I can come to You and I can commend my spirit into your hands. And He is faithful to come to you and apply the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in bringing forgiveness for your sins, in bringing light into your darkness, bringing healing where there is, uh, where there is healing needed, bringing and putting the pieces back into a broken spirit and a broken life. A broken heart. The darkest day doesn't stay dark forever. It is from the darkness of the tomb that new life springs forth. Spend some time at the foot of the cross as Jesus is lifted up today that you will be drawn closer to Him. Let us pray together. Father, when we survey the wondrous cross on which the only begotten Son was crucified, we barely can begin to comprehend the fullness of that sacrifice how Your Holy Son poured out His life as a sacrifice that we might have forgiveness. Father, we would ask as we worship Him today during this season of year for the forgiveness that comes through the cross, through the power that comes through the cross, with a full realization that it is finished. The battle is over because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And today, Father, we commend our spirits and our lives into Your hands that You might have Your way of living through us. Fill us, Father, with Your presence as we live for You and worship You through Christ's precious name. Amen.